Commissioner Holland, Finance Committee. All we right, didn't give you, you much time. I was going to mention that there was one commissioner missing in, uh, in Ann's background picture. <laughs> um, but we have, so we have a couple of presentations this evening and, and a couple of pieces of new business. So we'll start with our stormwater fee presentation from Arcadis. Um, and who do we have? Tony Dill. Tony on? Yes, I am. Hello, everybody. Right. Tony, I just want to say this. I'm sorry. But Tony Dill follows a long discussion on pickleball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. So, Tony, please um, move. Uh, you know, go go forward with your presentation and uh, just take in, into consideration the hour. Yeah, I, I will admit I've never started a presentation like this at ten fifteen at night. So, um, I'll apologize for 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 that, and I'll try to move it along. As, oh, as... We apologize. <laughs> um, okay. So. Um, we're bringing an up update on the stormwater fee study that we've been uh, working with the stormwater advisory committee and staff and looking to get some feedback on a couple of specific items tonight. Uh, one is the uh, residential rate structure. We've, we've talked about a few different options and, and want to bring that those in front of you. Um, what is the stormwater budget we should be taking forward uh, into the program and, and continue to convey to the public as, as we further engage the public in this process? And then uh, finally, how revenue gets managed as it comes in. Um, and I'll explain what that means in a, in a few minutes. So just a quick status, uh, we've gone through and done an, uh, impervious area calculations and analysis for the township. Uh, we've uh, done some analysis of rate structures We've prepared a, a, a budget and rate calculations, actually two versions that I'll, I'll share with you. We've held four stormwater advisory committee meetings and one public meeting and various other working group meetings with township staff. Um, we've prepared some preliminary credit policies and credits are how you get discounts off your, off your stormwater bill if you have uh, stormwater practices on your property. Um, we've initiated a billing system evaluation, and then the things that we kind of need in the near term going forward is uh, a preliminary decision on the budget and rate structure. So again, as we continue to communicate with the public, we, we know what message we want to send, and then we need to finalize the credit policy concepts. We have some comments from some of those in the Stormwater Advisory Committee and uh, a member of the public that we need to address as well. And then we'll continue to do that public outreach and stakeholder engagement as we, as we move forward with this process. So in terms of the residential rate structure, <clears throat> you know, uh, the overall goal uh, with a, any rate structure like this is to kind of balance the, the precision and equity with, with simplicity. You know, so you want to be fair, but you also want to be uh, easily administered. And for residential properties in the township, you would look at, at typically at two options. It was either a flat fee where you just put everybody into one bucket and they bill all, all the same as, as you may do for like a trash fee or into a, a tiered system where we, we put them into groups um, by, by parcel size, which is a sort of an indirect indicator as to the amount of impervious surface. For the non-residential multifamily properties, or sometimes we just refer to them as commercial, even though it's more than truly commercial properties, uh, we look at the actual amount of impervious surface on those properties to calculate a stormwater fee. And then undeveloped properties are still in like other natural state would, would not receive a fee. And just as a point of information, about two thirds of the stormwater utilities in Pennsylvania utilize a flat residential fee with the others using some type of tiered structure. Yeah, t Tony, just yes. to ask you a quick question, you, you started off by saying that you were, you were looking for guidance. So are you, are you going to want a decision on these bullet point items that you, that you started the presentation with this evening? Um, I mean, recognizing that nothing is a final decision, right, until something, a fee is adopted. But, um, you know, either, yes, in the near term, if not tonight, going forward, because at the next uh, you know, public meeting we have to talk about this, we, you know, I want to be able to convey where we think we're headed, you know, uh, for that feedback rather than continue to, to provide like a myriad of options out to the public, uh, I think. So that's, that's the goal, if we can get there. Okay. I, I just... You know, I, 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 yeah, I anticipate there'll be a lot of dialogue around that this evening. So I just wanted to know what you what you needed to move forward. Yeah, and, and you know, recognizing the hour and everything, if we can't get there, maybe it's a, we'll have to come back at a time when when we can get the the, the decisions uh, made. So, so, excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Did so? Did you want to discuss the 
come to a, a tentative agreement on the rate structure now or wait till the end of the presentation? Well, I, I feel like if, and that's, uh, that's another thing, I was going to recommend that, but then I, I changed my mind because I thought if we, if we opened up that can of worms, we probably wouldn't make it to the end of the presentation. Got so, it. so with, with that, I would just say, just pay very close attention. If we, if we don't get to a decision tonight, uh, we'll have to circle back on this very soon. Right. And, and I can kind of chunk this presentation. There's like a group of slides here about race structure. And then at the end of that, see if there's any consensus. If there's not a clear consensus, we'll move on to the next topic and, 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 and do that. So on, on a macro scale, when we look at the stormwater fee and rate structure, you look at the total costs of the stormwater program and you divide it by the number of billing units. And in this case, billing units, we, we refer to as equivalent residential units, which is the average amount of impervious area with a typical residential property in the township or in, in ERU. And so we divide the one by the other to calculate uh, the fee or the, or the rate, if you would say. Uh, this, this graph is um, something I, I I've never quite used before, but we had the data here. So what this shows us, and it's just for information purposes, is that um, the larger lots on average have more impervious surface. So the horizontal axis on this graph is the size of a property and the vertical axis is the amount of impervious area. So we did a sample of residential properties in the township and did a detailed ch uh, check on the amount of impervious area and accounted for all their driveways and everything. And as you can see on the left, the small properties uh, that are less than a tenth of an acre, that's that, that first vertical line, have less impervious area than, you know, than larger properties. But there's a lot of scatter in the data, right? Uh, the, the horizontal line that says one ERU, that's the average, uh, weighted average amount of impervious area there is in the township. I just share this information because the Stormwater Advisory Committee and some of the township members that have been involved in discussions have looked at this and said, this, this probably does support the idea of trying to have some type of tiered structure rather than just charging everybody the same flat rate. So a little more granular information, this table in the bottom right here shows that when we look at all the properties that are less than a 10th of an acre in size in the first row, they have on average 1,696 square feet of impervious area. That's 48% of the ERU size. The ERU or equivalent residential unit is 3,508 square feet. So when we, when we weight all these together, a weighted average of all this, um, that's the average amount of impervious area per residential parcel. Um, when you go down this table, you see condos, we grouped them all together where we looked at uh, the dwelling unit plus the common areas that uh, like parking lots that may be managed by an HOA and attributed that to those condos. So on average, they have 63% of an ERU's worth of uh, impervious area. And as you go down the table, you can see the cohorts we have 0.1 to 0 0.25, 0 0.25 to 0.5 acre, and then all the way down to lots that are greater than an acre in size, <clears throat> having on average, you know, 368%. As, as much impervious. So if you did a flat rate structure, as I mentioned, all residential properties are just put in one group and they all pay the same. So you'd have, in this case, 10,012 billing units uh, before you uh, entertain a credit program, but just the, the, the gross amount of, of billing units. If you look at a tiered structure and, and with earlier meetings uh, with the, the Stormwater Advisory Committee and Township uh, folks that we met with, um, there was a desire if we went to a tiered structure, keep it rather simple, maybe a three tier, possibly four tier structure, as opposed to a five, six, seven, you know, high, uh, more involved tier structure. So when we looked at a three tier structure is what we kind of focused in on. We had to decide, well, where do we put the condos when we group them in with uh, these other size uh, properties? And uh, there's a couple of options and it does have a slight impact on the total amount of, of ERUs. Um, and the, the concept of a tiered structure is, you know, smaller properties get a discount, the larger properties uh, pay more. So the first uh, th uh, tiered structure is a three tiered structure we looked at where we said we pick all the real small properties that are less than a tenth of an acre and they would pay a half of an ERU. Um, so they get a basically a 50% discount. The majority of properties, in this case, 7,588 uh, that are the, between a tenth of an acre and a half acre, and if we lump the condos in with them, we'd pay one ERU. And then all the properties greater than a half uh, acre would pay two ERUs. Another option is we put the condos in with the less than the 10th of an acre uh, group. 
and and so they uh, get the 50% discount as well, and that has a reduction of 400 ERUs uh, in the total count for the township. All that means is the the base rate would have to be slightly higher to generate the same amount of revenue if you have fewer ERUs or billing units you're multiplying by. Uh, and another option, of course, is just to keep the condos out as their own separate group and not try and lump them in with either group because they're kind of in between. And that would uh, result in a four tier system here where they, in this case, I said, instead of a half ERU, since they're a little bit bigger, they have 63% of, of the amount of imperious, they, you could charge them 0.6 ERUs. And that results in the 10,150. And, and at our most recent stormwater advisory committee meeting, and uh, some folks uh, mentioned, well, what if we just tr build the HOA and didn't we, we didn't build the individual condo property owners and the HOA would then have to raise their fees to collect all that revenue back from the individual condo units. Um, and my other experiences that, that has never been implemented that way. I'm not saying it couldn't be. There's just some issues, I guess, if an HOA has members that aren't paying their fees, then, then they're gonna have trouble paying their bill and they have to uh, budget for that on maybe an annual basis. So um, there's some logistical things there that would have to be taken into consideration, but it would, would be an option. It would sort of take them out of the residential group entirely and just treat them like any other commercial property. Um, another question that was brought up on our advisory committee meeting is, well, could we ignore lot size and say, put the residential properties into groups based on actual amount of impervious area they have. Um, Cause you could have a very large house on a small property or a very small house on a big property, you know, those outliers. So why would we, can we just ignore the lot size entirely? And I would say you could, but the data that we currently have does not support us being able to do an accurate um, tiering based on impervious surface. We received some raw data from uh, the county that was available um, as you can see on the screen, uh, the yellow is the impervious area that was already digitized before we got involved in these properties. And you can see there's some missing buildings, missing parking lots, uh, uh, driveways, uh, some driveways that are shown overlapping parcel boundaries. And when we did our sample analysis, we took 5% of the properties and made a highly accurate digitization to make sure we got it right. Um, uh, and that can be extrapolated, but if we wanted to go down a, a, a path of using the actual impervious area for residential properties to, to put them into a billing group, a different differentiated billing group, we'd have to put in extra effort that's not, you know, in our current budget or, or scope of our services or, or fee to, to, I think, reconcile all this to make sure you don't get lots of uh, appeals coming out of it. Um, just one more thing to share on this general topic here is the, um, Law, the res, the, the non-residential properties, we've measured the exact amount of impervious area for all of them. And you can see when we've ag aggregated them together, like the school district has the most amount of uh, impervious surface or ERUs. And then as you go down the list, you see the township, Katie University, SEPTA, uh, several other entities as you go down this list. When we aggregate all together, we have you know almost 8,500 ERUs. We assume about 15% of those is lost through a credit program. So that, that results about 7,178 net ERUs. Um, you know, this is in addition to the 10,000 or so residential uh, ERUs um, to which we may also lose some of those through a credit program as well. So that's sort of the denominator of, of the fee. You know, then the, the budget on the top of the, of the calculation is what is used to calculate the rate. So, that, that, so that's sort of the rate structure information that I wanted to discuss. Uh, the next item I would be going to is the looking at the budget um, because we have a couple of options of uh, what budget we look at. So Tony, um, let me jump in. Um, yes. I know I have been in, in all these meetings. Uh, I believe Commissioner Holland was in all or most. And I know Commissioner Rappaport was in those meetings as well. I think the lean um, by the stormwater advisory group after we went through probably two meetings was to, to do the tiered pricing and to do either the three or four tier. Uh, there's not that much difference in, in terms of the administration. So I think the, the, the lean was to probably do three tiers 
and just have, you know, the smaller properties would fall in at half an ERU. The average properties, which is, which is you know, 75% of the properties would fall in one ERU. And, and you know, about 20% of our properties would would go into the two ERU calculation. With the condos, which one are you going with? That, well, in the top one, the condo stayed within um, a three-tiered environment. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, the only thing I will say, uh, there was a little bit of discussion in one of our meetings that, um, and this could be potentially accounted for through credit policies, um, but there are some organizations, entities, these these HOAs where, you know, they maintain their own infrastructure, their own private interior roads, um, stormwater drainage systems, things like that, that the township doesn't provide the, any services, right? Because it's private property, right? In terms of plowing or salting or pavement repairs. So um, do any of those HOAs pay taxes in, for things that um, maybe they don't receive the same full benefit that other property owners do? I'm not- but Tony, wouldn't they have BMPs? Um, wouldn't wouldn't the, those organizations also have best management practices that, that would have been part of the arrangement that they um, had with the township? Uh, some of them may, some of them may not. I'm not really sure if they all have some type of stormwater management or some of them were old enough that they were built before that may have been required and, 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 and don't have anything, I, I guess. So to, really to sure. that issue, I think the only thing that kind of hangs out there is what would be the fairest way and the most equitable way to deal with the condos to, you know, to that question and to your question, Dan, are we doing it? But, but clearly the tiered structure, whether it goes in the, the, um, the top or the middle one seems to, you know, seems to be the, the way that the advisory group did it. Maybe we have to do a special handling or a special treatment on the condos. Okay, I like that idea. Can, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, can we reach some tentative direction on this? Uh, we can, we can try. Um, so would that be through a vote or is there, is there a motion? Do I hear? I'll make the, I'll make the motion to accept what, what the advisory committee just represented by Commissioner Zygmuntfeld was suggesting. Um, you mentioned three or four. I I like the the, the top one here, um, the three tier with condos in the middle. May I ask a question before you vote? Uh, is that Mr. Hislop? It is. Yes. Go ahead. Wasn't sure if the raising a hand would be effective. <laughs> Mr. Dill, would you uh, go back to your original chart that had tiers? I believe you had one that exceeded. <clears throat> even a thousand, maybe that's it. Is this it? Uh, did you have one that was larger than um, one acre? Um, well, this, this table here shows greater than an acre. I didn't Correct. differentiate above that. Okay, so number of parcels is only 210, I see that. But I'm just wondering if you, if you can move any of these lines, that's my other question. Um, for example, did you necessarily in your sample size, did you fix 0.1 and did you fix 0.25 acres and did you fix 0.5 and then one acre or, or did you do a, a sample such that you could move and see where the 1700 doubles without doing any extra work? You could just see because I, I, my concern is the 1700 and the 24 to 2600 and then the 4,000 and then the 13,000, even if there aren't too many of them, I think you know, you're know you letting the larger ones get away with two ERUs, for example, or, or twice. And, and even if there's a small sample size, if it were more like the reality here of 2,000, 4,000, 6,000, 12,000, something like that, uh, I think you would encourage the larger property owners then to use that extra space for stormwater. And then they would eventually no negotiate themselves down. 
but um, do you have the ability to, or are you fixed at 0 0.1, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and one? No, there's no, um, there, there's no magic to these these increments. Um, you know, you could you could look at looking at different uh, groupings, if you will. Um, so from your sample, you could say take 15, 30, 60, 90, and do, and even though it's more tiers, you're only assigning it once and you're assigning it by parcel size. You're not signing it by, as you said, impervious area. So, you, so you could just go through and you could see, even if you have more tiers, I think that would encourage people. It, first of all, takes away the boundary conditions of what happens if my acre is just a little bit too big or too small. Mr. Hislop, I think you're getting us into that nuanced area that we've had these discussions in the stormwater advisory group on. And I would suggest, I think that we have to go at this at, at a manageable level from an administrative standpoint. Yes, they did sampling to establish sizes. And if you looked at the variations in the tiers, there wasn't that big a difference in the number of ERUs. And so my point of view on this is that we can either spend an inordinate amount of additional time debating this, or we can put it into play and then make adjustments as the, um, as the determinations of either credits or questioning when somebody in fact has done, um, you know, reduction of their impervious area. We, we have the right and they have the right to bring that to us, but, but you know, structuring nine or, or 10 different tiers is not going to solve um, either the administrative issue or simplify what we need to get into, which is having a manageable process that can be administered within the township auspices. So I am asking for manageable. I'm not asking for more work. I, I'm, I'm going to disagree with that. I think that you have been you know, on a number of occasions within the advisory group, and I'm not, this is not personal, so you know it's not coming. I think that, that you know, you, you sought more accurate impervious area measurement that is just an impractical and too costly. This is and different. I, and this I think we have to maintain a manageable or controllable number of tiers. And this is a I'm, different I'm going to make the point, I think that um, from the uh, directional input, from the stormwater advisory group, I think that the three or four tier direction was clearly the most preferred. I understand you have concerns about accuracy and, and exactitude, and, and that's something that's always going to plague us, but we have to be get, get past that. We really do. I'm not asking for more work. The number of EDUs is not, ERUs is not the question. I'm simply asking Tony with the analysis that he already has, would he be able, not, not extra work, would he be able to shuffle something that would be fairer without, without doing the extra sampling? That was it. Yeah, yeah, it, it would, yes. I, we could have a five, a six, a seven, an eight tier system if we wanted without a lot of extra work to get there. That's just the question is, do we want a five, six or seven or eight tier system? The feedback I'd gotten before from the majority, not admitted every member of the committee of uh, stormwater advisory committee was uh, leaning towards wanting to have fewer tiers. Um, but yeah, and, 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 I, and I don't think that that um, has changed, um, you know, from the majority, Tony. So I think, you know, Mr. Hislop, I think I, I get what you're saying on the larger parcels, you know, an acre plus, you know, but I think, you know, we're looking for, um, you know, some sort of consistency and, and ease of implementation. Um, and I think, you know, we do have a motion on the table uh, for Tony, if you could go back to that slide showing the uh, yep. um, condos here. So we know what we're voting on. So the, the recommendation uh, was for the three tier uh, residential, basically option one on this slide. Uh, so condos, uh, uh, you know, basically in essence paying one ERU, you know, a small parcels, a half an ERU and parcels greater than uh, a half acre, uh, two ERUs. 
I'm going to make that as a motion uh, in the form of a recommendation of the committee. Well, yes, yeah. I was just restating Dan's motion. Yes. I want to make that in the form of a motion that we accept this as a rate structure. The uh, three tiers that's at the top where condos is in the middle. I'm, I'm you know, I, I don't know if we have a number for it. So I'm referring to it as, as the top option on this screen. All right. Um, all in favor of that mm -hmm. motion? Aye. 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 Any any opposed? Consensus. Next big decision. Tony, what's the next and decision? Next, let's go to the, the budget. Okay. Um, so what you'll see on screen here is in 2020 at uh, this table at the top, we show the all in budget for stormwater uh, was about 1.7 million when you factor in all the staff time that contributes at least part of their time to stormwater. Um, and it's, it's broken into these series of things of street sweeping and leaf collection operation and maintenance that includes inspection and cleaning and repairs of inlets and pipes and outfalls. Um, and then there's some debt associated with projects. Um, when we go from 2020 over to the right-hand column, 2022, um, to a, a proposed uh, stormwater program that's been developed with input of various uh, folks from the township and engineer and committee over time, it's taking the budget from about 1.7 million up to over 3.3 million. There's about 143,000 of that is really just inflationary increase over a couple of years. There's also some other, uh, the way that some legacy debt was structured, there's some increased uh, debt service uh, uh, coming due uh, payments. And then the balance about one and a half million is for what I call an improved level of service. And uh, that's really new capital projects that are either flood control projects or pollutant reduction plan projects required through the MS4 permit um, or other operation and maintenance uh, work where uh, the township, like most other communities I've worked with and, and throughout the country, um, have a lot of deferred maintenance on stormwater infrastructure. There's old corrugated metal pipes in the ground, there's old inlets, there's old things, and needing to start playing some catch up on those things uh, as we move forward into the future. So, so just let me help uh, with the clarifying the explanation. What this basically does is it unbundles all of our current expenses associated with stormwater management, the sewer, the cleaning of the gutters, anything, leaf collection, all those things are being accounted for. Because if you remember, um, a number of us, me included, kept questioning the line item of stormwater management and our annual budget being in the $400,000 range. So what they've done is they've isolated every possible line item and expense associated with stormwater. And so as soon as we, we would put the fee in place, it starts from dollar one and all those dollars. Now, what it also does is it takes, um, uh, you know, something close to a million seven out of our current line items and incorporates it into a stormwater budget as a separate line item. Correct. So we we had uh, some lengthy discussions about, well, a stormwater fee could be enacted to fund um, just the incremental costs of the, the program and leave everything else we're already doing funded out of the general fund and through taxes, or we could take everything we're doing stormwater, uh, the full 3.3 million or the, the pie chart on the right and say all that should be funded through the fee. It, it reduces uh, pressure on the general fund, but of course it's gonna result in a larger stormwater fee, right? We're trying to recover more revenue through a stormwater fee. Um, and I, so we did rate calculations both ways just to, to, to and we've shared it with, uh, with the committee uh, before. So and we might need to do an adjustment literally in our, um, in our real estate taxes in terms of the calculation of the fees from that, that have been embedded in our public works and all the other things that are stormwater related. That's not something we have to decide now, but directionally, what this also does is anybody who is not paying stormwater management fees of any kind right now uh, has to be in the position of paying from dollar one, from function one. They have an obligation to the township 
on, you know, on all the expenses associated as opposed to just the incremental dollars. Right. So this table I'm showing right here is a, a rate and cash flow projection saying if we were to fund the full stormwater program through rates uh, and the estimated 16,689 ERUs, which is the net amount we think we would, it's an estimate of what we would collect after any credits are issued through the credit policy, um, results in a rate of around $55 a quarter. Now, th these are presented in a quarter because it's just typically how we look at these and a lot of the, the other metrics to compare. But in reality, most likely this would be billed on an annual basis on the existing tax bill. So that 55 would be a, a $220 a year bill for anyone who's receiving one ERU. So that would be similar to the refuse fee. It's a flat fee. And it's flat fee based on the number of ERUs that your property would have allocated. Well, one ERU would be $220 a year. Whether right. or not we charge a flat fee is a separate discussion. I'm Somebody sorry, I know, but I meant to, that it would be either, it would be the 220, the 440, whatever, or the 110, depending right. on how many ERUs had been allocated to, for, or for your property. Right, right. And if you're commercial property, you would pay, you know, based on your amount of impervious area, divided by 3,508 square feet, and that's how many ERUs you would be charged um, times whatever rate we agree to. So this $55 a quarter um, if, is for the full program. If a decision was made to only fund the sort of imp uh, the enhanced level of service here and leave all the existing stormwater funding out of the general fund, still funded out of the general fund, then that rate would drop to around $24.50 a quarter or just a little under $100 uh, a year um, as, as the rate. If we look at just some examples. So, that, you know, obviously a residential property for most residential properties that are paying one ERU, the rate would be somewhere between 25 and $55 a quarter. As you move up to something like a gas station or a church or a big box store with more ERUs, you can see that rate goes up. So on the big box store, for example, uh, at the higher end, it'd be 5,500 a quarter or, you know, that's what, 22,000 a year uh, fee um, versus a, you know, $10,000 fee. Uh, these are all what you would be billed without any credits uh, recognized. So if, uh, for example, if the big box store had a, had a stormwater detention basin and it had a approved credit for 25% or something, then it would pay 25% less than that. What have you told us in the past? I know you've given us some information on what the average um, stormwater management fee is in other townships. So good question. Um, <laughs> this uh, shows in Pennsylvania, the average, this data is maybe six months or a year old, you know, when we were last sort of uh, querying this, but around $22 a quarter. Um, there's about 46 utilities in Pennsylvania, and you can see it ranges down from under $10 to over uh, between 40 and 45. Um, you know, none of them are at that $55 per quarter level. Now, it's important to note that this range in, in fees you're seeing here is largely because there's also a range in services provided. You know, it's not like every stormwater program has the same scope of their program. Some may include leaf collection and street sweeping within the scope of it. Some remove that from the scope and, and fund it out of their general fund. So it's not that the townships or communities on the left have figured out just how to do it cheaper and the ones on the right are, you know, haven't, it's, it's lots, largely the, the scopes of their programs are different than what they're trying to accomplish and fund. Well, the other thing is we need to think about the fact that this is an initiative that reflects a, a different commitment to stormwater and flooding remediation that hasn't been done in this municipality ever. So we're taking on a big obligation um, and the fact is that if you look, Philadelphia is more close is is closer to the the number that we propose um, for the for our one ERU in terms of the the quarterly number. And you know, I guess I, you know the point is you know we're also looking ten years down the pike on all those capital projects. You guys probably don't remember or you haven't been exposed to, but the, there was a page that listed the number of potential projects across the municipality over the next 10 years. And you're talking about probably uh, in excess 
of 100 products, each one having different levels of magnitude. But the point being that it's looking at how do we get our hands around and our, and our investment in doing this in a way that we don't have to deal with uh, anything other than the extraordinary events. Right now, uh, you know, an inch of rain creates havoc in the township. And sometimes, you know, a couple inches of rain create da dangerous situations. We have never undertaken the job, This not this board, but other boards have never undertaken that job. So part of this is really un just like with selling the sewer system, it's, it's recognizing a problem and it's taking on the obligation to fix it in one way we conveyed the sewer system. In this way, I think what we're doing is we're taking on something that I think is more manageable. We're not facing 70 to $100 million of repair. We're over time facing something probably in the neighborhood of another. If you take a, a say one and a half million over, over 10 years, somewhere between 15 and 20 million. Or Mr. Tony, Chair, who, who decides how much is spent? Uh, what pro what projects the Stormwater Authority we do uh, takes on? Well, well, there right is the township right unless you create an authority. But right now there isn't a stormwater you know authority, um, and okay. that's actually the next agenda item I had on here is just sort of how that revenue actually gets captured and managed. But, um, but so the commissioners could manage it. We don't have to have an independent authority. We would be adding a couple people though. It's not an independent authority, but there would be jobs allocated to work on stormwater management as a dedicated role within public works and, and within the, the normal functioning of the township. Maybe, maybe if I could just add to that, Dan, maybe what you're looking for is creating a stormwater advisory committee who would make sure that these funds are being utilized the appropriate way. The board would make the decisions, but somewhat a, a resident group would make sure they're not being spent on playground equipment or you know police vehicles. It's being used as specified here. That would be the recommendation I would make. Commissioner Rappaport. Yeah, thank you. And and to that point, uh, what our township manager uh, said that was an important point that came up in our um, advisory committee meetings. The idea that um, this is a dedicated pool of revenue that would only be uh, dedicated to these uh, services and these projects, and there would not be mingling with the general fund. And that was an important piece in terms of transparency of the funds and, um, and accountability of those funds. The other thing I wanted to emphasize, two other things about why Cheltenham is not well, like that this particular chart and uh, the implications you might take from it are not really applicable. Uh, as Mr. Dill said, all of these, uh, you know, all of these amounts represent different situations, different kinds of municipalities. Um, Cheltenham is one of the densest in terms of building and population. So it, it really isn't comparable to those. And the, um, the way it's structured in each of those different municipalities, you're not talking apples to apples. They are just not comparable. And you know, I was shaking my head when I saw this because I had hoped, I, you know, you want, you want to know where we fall, but this is not really, and I, I think Tony really said that, this, but it, it stands emphasizing this is not really the way you judge whether ours is out of line or not. It's not a good comparison. Oh. Um, no, okay. That, that, that's, that's correct. And, and one other point, Tony, can you go back to the slide with the um, gas station slide? Yeah. So um, you know, one of the things we also, I think we should think about when we're thinking about the fee is you know what this is designed for right and it's really a design it's designed to be you know the people that are contributing to the problem pay the most to solve the problem right so if you if you discount the fee um you you're you're 
you're discounting the fee from a residential perspective, which helps the residents, but you're also discounting it for the large property owners, which doesn't help the residents because they are carrying a disproportionately higher share because we gave a discount and, and the larger property owners are benefiting from the discount. Yeah, you think so, need to think of it as a user fee. It, exactly. So, so in, in my opinion, I, I think the way you, you get at this is, you know, you, you have to fund, you, well, first, I, I think we should fully fund all of the stormwater management, you know, in, in this fee. So not some in our operating budget and then some in the fee, it just gets too messy, you know, just fund everything from this fee, fully fund the program, you know, across all classes, residential, all, all the way up. And, you know, everybody sort of pays their fair share, you know, we'll be on the higher end from a residential perspective, but also what that means is, you know, those higher ERU entities will be contributing uh, significantly more than they would with a lower fee. Uh, Commissioner Pransky, then Commissioner North. You're on mute, Brad. Yes, I was, I was just saying, I said I noticed I'm muted. Give me one second and I was unmuting. Um, I'm unclear as to advantages or disadvantages of having a separate authority. Um, all the discussions we've had in the past seem to indicate we wanted a separate authority for this. So, you know, somebody just clarify for me where our, our benefits and, and lack of them show up either on either side, because I'm fine with both. I just want to understand it better. I have one slide here. It just I bring it up in three uh, things just to quickly address that topic because it may help. Um, there's, there's three main ways we've thought of managing the revenue that comes in. One is you just remain as you're operating now and you have a, a line item in the budget for stormwater and you, you make a commitment to the public that we're gonna only use that revenue for stormwater. Um, the concern that was raised in the stormwater advisory committee is, is down the road. You could have some future board members decide to just you know, reallocate that stormwater revenue to any other use. You know, It's not locked in, to, in any other way other than sort of a commitment. Uh, a second option is when that money comes in, it goes into an enterprise fund for stormwater. Um, that gets a separate annual audit uh, at, at some nominal cost to make sure that money is only being used for stormwater purposes. And that helps provide some assurance to the public that's what it's being used for. Uh, and then the third option is creating a stormwater authority where you know the stormwater revenue would be deposited into the authority. They would reimburse back to the township for stormwater O&M system operation and maintenance. Uh, some upfront you know, legal assistance to set up that authority. Um, at you know, creating a board of three or five or seven members, um, creating a charter, you know, et, et cetera. And it still has a separate audit that would occur with it each year. Uh, the preliminary discussions we've had uh, have sort of pointed towards option two here. An enterprise fund is sort of the simpler way to handle this, but also provide some assurance to the public that, you know, this really is what the money is going to be used for. Mitch, is that what the committee sort of decided was the best route? Absolutely, to go? yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Dan, did you have a question? Uh, yes. So it's, uh, I guess it's for the advisory committee. Uh, my concern, uh, I understand what Ann was saying, but frankly, when I look at that chart, um, I get uh, concerned that we are talking about a dollar amount that's frankly off the chart. And so my question is on the budget, uh, to what extent are the new projects that are incorporated into that $3 million that you came up with, um, to what extent are they a wish list, um, which could be uh, pared back or taken a second look at in order to, um, to reduce that $55? And I guess so, I'll- So I'll, before, yeah. so Tony, before you answer that, could, can you go back to the bar chart? Uh, the, the one that showed all the communities on it? Yes. So Dan, the, um, just one thing to point out here is we don't know what these other communities are, are funding in their stormwater fee versus what they're funding out of operating. So they could very, very, they, they could be charging, they could be spending $55 per ERU 
but just splitting it between um, the stormwater and their operating budget. Tony, don't you have some ideas to, if you've worked on these, you, you saw what dollars we put into it and where we took the dollars from. Yeah, I've worked on, on a couple of these, a few of these, you know, a lot of these are not, most of these are not our client, you know, these are just information we, we've gathered. So I don't have detailed insights to what's in the scope of that. I know, um, uh, I know Hamden Township is, I've been talking to some folks over the years that we were involved with them, have said that they think their, their fee is not high enough to cover everything they need to be doing, you know, in terms of the infrastructure reinvestment. Um, Swatera Township, um, where are they on here? Uh, is I, I know they are just <laughs> they're behind in terms of making headway into really assessing their system. Um, so they have a lot of needs, but haven't even really been able to get their arms around them to start doing a lot of work yet in terms of repairs. So a lot of these folks, I think, you know, created an initial fee that they felt was quite frankly sort of palatable. Um, and it's better than nothing, right? You know, and then once they get into it, uh, they, you know, I suspect some of these are going to need to increase over time as they really, you know, have to start putting out the projects and but doing it's the like, infrastructure. It, it's, smo it's smoke and mirrors, Dan, because you don't know how much they're spending in, in operating for on stormwater. Sure. Okay. Mr. So, Chairman? Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes, Bob? Um, I know one community that's on there. And it is a commingled between general fund and uh, also partially using this fund for some repair, repairs, but it was reduced by about 75% from what was proposed, just as what Tony said to make it palatable. But there is no way that fund can sustain projects that need to be done. So it's, it appears low because that's what it was to get it in and get it through but no projects have been done to date. And that's been about eight years. And again, you still have general fund money that's supporting it. So to say that is a true figure of what it's costing to do that is completely wrong. So I think that goes to the point of what Baron's saying, that that number for one of those communities right there is not an accurate reflection as to what's being pre pre presented here in Cheltenham. Yeah, okay. I, and, and 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 we talked in the um, and I'm sorry, we talked in the um, in the committee level that we weren't even going to show this slide to the public um, because it doesn't give a good representation of, <laughs> of of what it actually is, and there's no way to really justify that that number. So, um, yeah. So, okay. So you're you're suggesting that a number of these communities perhaps are underfunding or not fully allocating not the dollars. Okay, so what what if we were doing the reverse? Uh, what if we're overfunding? Um, and that's why I'm going to actually speak in favor of the money going into that first line, the general fund, um, because it gives you the flexibility that if the dollars were overfunded that they could be moved into something else. If you if you actually say that you that these dollars raised cannot be used for anything else other than stormwater projects, um, it it ties your hands and actually we're tying our own hands. The idea of a separate group is because you don't trust. Um, you're saying you don't trust future commissioners, I guess, um, to properly use the funds. Well, and, and the only comment I'll make to that is even at the fee that we're proposing, we have more projects that are on the table right now that even this fund, what we're proposing, won't be able to fund all those projects. I, I don't think we will ever be in a position to be where we'll have extra excess money unless the board decides not to do projects and it continues to mount and mount and mount. And, and, and if, you have, if you have excess, you just lower the fee. That, exactly. Yeah, it, it, I, I, we can talk about this more offline, but I, I think I'd have to agree that you have to have it at an enterprise fund, not in the first group, because if it's challenged in the beginning, you're going to have to assure everyone, the challengers, the court, everyone, that that money is earmarked for stormwater fees only, and it's not high because it's going to be used for other um, projects, capital projects. Oh, it's challenged by non -ta current non-taxpayers. 
Correct. Correct. Or, or whoever decides to challenge it, who feels that it's um, yeah. uh, oppressive to them. And that makes sense. frankly, it could be in a group of people, a class doing that. Right. Because the basis of the fee is impervious surface, which is, you know, a, you know, there's correlation to the more impervious surface, the more stormwater runoff you generate. But obviously that impacts maintenance and management of the stormwater system. But like you're saying, if, if it was used for other purposes, then you could start arguing, well, why am I being charged on the, that money on the basis of impervious, and, you know. And Mitch, I think I heard you mention earlier that under consideration would be um, a, a, a cut in the real estate tax. Potentially. I mean, if, if we're taking a million four out of right. our current operating budget, what we're doing is basically now how where we're at, you know, in a year from now, we don't know, but Right. But here's but, it's but that's a place where we're we're now saying from dollar one, every dollar that goes into stormwater management management is being accounted for. And and to, to uh, Bob Z's point, you know, the projects, the list of projects are substantial. I'd make this other point that I think I've made, you know, in one of the stormwater advisory meetings. This is also demonstrating a level of responsibility that we're taking with flooding and, and things that the DEP has had questions about Cheltenham's resolve to do stuff. And what we're basically demonstrating is, this is something we did the, the action with our sewer system. We know that we have certain obligations to be able to take certain things on. And we're saying to, to the regulatory bodies, we're going, you know, we're not just, we haven't just conveyed the sewer system, but we've taken on the responsibility of controlling stormwater across the township over a 10 year period. So work with us, DEP, because we've made this extended commitment. And I think that's that's a, a story and a message to a regulatory body that has some meaning. The other thing is, I think when we go look for capital funds from the state or the federal government, or we went to the Army Corps and we're demonstrating our commitment along these lines, I think it puts us in a much better position of being able to make the argument and saying, we've made this commitment, we need you to work with us on it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I, I think just from a public perception and, and reception issue, if obviously if, if, if they thought this fee was coming along with a new fee was coming on with also a tax cut, it probably helps cushion the, the blow. But if that's not the intent, obviously, then, you know, we, we wouldn't want to, you know, communicate that uh, in any way. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, if we do take a million and a half from operations that we use for stormwater and, and you know, moved it over, I mean, we have so many other non-stormwater capital projects that are short-term in nature that we probably wouldn't want to borrow money for that we could use you know, use those funds for. So, I mean, it, you know, to Tony's point, I don't know if we would want to position it that way, but. Um, well, if you don't, you're talking about a, a $200 tax increase. Well, Dan, the people in the stormwater advisory yeah. group basically gave us feedback. They thought that was not an unreasonable amount of money. Yeah. And, and I, and I think, you know, we, uh, I don't think we can soft shoe this issue, right? We have a problem and this problem is something that's been ge generated over multiple years. And to be quite frankly, it's been kicked down the road. The can's been kicked down the road for too long and, and we can't afford to kick the can anymore. And, and we are the body that is standing up and is gonna do something about it. So yes, you are going to have to pay more, everybody, right? Proportional Never. to your contribution to the problem. And we're gonna make sure that these funds are, are isolated in a way that they're only used to solve the problem, which is in the end of the day going to benefit everyone. But I, you know, I don't, I don't know if we, you know, I, it is what it is, right? The only way we're going to solve this problem is by spending money. Are we, are we at the point where we want to try and make a, a preliminary uh, decision on which uh, rate we want to take forward to further public meetings and things, the full program rate or the incremental or continue to present it as a range. We could go either way, you know. I, I would make a motion for the full program rate 
um, given that that would give us the, uh, you know, the biggest impact, you know, to allow us to, to solve the problem and would uh, give the uh, most uh, appropriate proportion of, um, of uh, you know, sort of big box, big property owners to, to residential. Um, and then I see a hand from Fred Milbert. Uh, so we will take his question. Mute. Fred, you're on mute. Fred, you're on mute. Which is why it sounds so good. <laughs> you're still muted, Fred. I'm, I got him. There you go. Um, this is a wonderful idealistic concept, but I think we're losing sight of where we are at this point. We are coming out of COVID. You just raised your EIT. You're talking about a library tax. The school district is gonna whack you this year because they're 5 million budget. To then hit the community and the businesses with this kind of money, I, I just don't see how you're gonna do it. I, I just think you're gonna drive businesses out of here, community people out of here. It's an enormous amount of money. Um, and put it in the context of what's going on here. I mean, it's a great idea, but I just, I just can't see it. Uh, I just cannot see it as a business person or an individual, this kind of money being raised in the context of what's going on. It's, it's great that you're thinking about doing this and doing all this wonderful work, but I just don't, I think the community is going to raise hell on this. You may have had people that, who were on the advisory committee that were concerned about the floods and things like that, but we just had a, you've just raised a lot of taxes and Montgomery County is going to be raising taxes. I just don't see it. Um, uh, that's just my personal opinion. I would love to have all these things accomplished, but I don't, I just don't think it's the, I don't think it's feasible. I really, I think it's going to be a real uh, problem for you. It, I could be completely wrong, but I just think given the context, we, you're going to get a lot of pushback on the kind of dollars you're raising from the, look at the business, big box store is going to be saying $20,000. A synagogue could be having six, $7,000. That's a lot of money in today's world when they have no money at all. I'm just, you know, putting in the context of that. Commissioner Holland, uh, can, yes. am I correct that a, a number was proffered earlier that if we didn't do this, what the potential tax increase would be to take care of the storm remediation? Tony? Um, I don't think we've, we haven't done that calculation. Uh, we were trying to acquire some of the data to do that and, and I think we hit a roadblock earlier on um, to, to do an exact calculation. Um, I think that would help because I think everything, if, I'm, if my memory serves me correctly, and it often does not, um, I think our preliminary conversations showed that the tax increases, especially year over year, would be substantial unless we sort of nip this in the bud and was able to get everyone to contribute, including the nonprofits, uh, to an area that they normally don't have to pay any extra burden given their contribution to the problem. By the way, one thing, is the 16,000 ERUs include the township and the school district? No, there's no purpose in that. Yes. Coach. No, that's, that, it includes it, correct? Yes. Well then, you're not, are you taxing the school district? We're charging them a stormwater fee. We're not okay. taxing them. So they, they're going to they pass are, it on. It would probably be, it would probably be in the township would probably be excused from that. Well, then so you have to increase approximately, uh, approximately 1200 of the 8,400 or one seventh. So you have to increase your township two, property. You'd have to increase your fee by that one seventh to get your money. Right. 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 If we didn't bill those units, uh, then you would have to have a higher rate to collect the same amount of revenue. Which correct. is equivalent to 260? Well, um, doing, your, doing your math quickly in my head. If, if it was 1,200, 85% of that, uh, because we assumed we'd lose 15% to accredits. Um, and, and, and that assumption is assuming we have a credit program, right? Which we haven't fully flushed out 
I got disconnected, so I don't know if you touched on that already. We did. So, uh, Mr. Mr. Hislop, we're coming to you next. So we're we're talking about whatever the number is. We're again increasing that dollar. Yeah, it'd be a, I'm a rough estimate, maybe a six six percent increase or something over what the rates we were already talking about, six okay. to seven percent. So, but to to Brad's point, uh, Fred, I think you know we we have to do this. You know, we have to do something. Oh, right? I agree. I just think so, what we just discussed, the tax increases are going to be worse. Right. So so the money's going to come. You know, we have projects that we have to do. So the money's going to come out of operating or it's going to come out of a stormwater. And there are people who don't contribute to the tax base that would with a stormwater, which would be helpful. So, Mr. Hislop. Yes, and um, while I do think that this does need to be done for all the reasons mentioned, I think Mr. Milbert is correct that there will be quite a backlash and therefore do it carefully, which was my only incentive in the fairness steps. And if that could be easily done without more work. So I'm trying to minimize the, the complaints um, and that, that is the next step either way. I, I do think there will be a tremendous backlash in this and yet I do think it has to be done. Mr. Chairman? Uh, Bob and then Dan. Sure, uh, one thing I will say and to Mr. Milbert's point, um, 50 years ago, this problem probably started if not long ago and no one had the political courage or will to step up and do these projects, which probably would have cost a million dollars, maybe $2 million. Right now though, the infrastructure is taking a beating of the township because of this flooding. Uh, it's no longer that you can continue to say, you know, let's kick the can, let's push it down the road, let's not do it. Uh, unfortunately, the can can't be kicked anymore. It's hit the wall. So now's the determination. What do you do? Do you, do you start to fix these problems that have been around for 50 plus years, if not longer, or do you decide now we've got to start fixing these at a reasonable fee uh, that you can start now making impact and start making a headway? Because it's only going to get more expensive now each year to try to build these projects. Uh, so at some point you've got to begin and this has gone on for way too long. And I don't think the township can, can, can worry about, well, the schools are going to raise taxes. They're going to do this. So the township always falls to the bottom of the pile. And, well, we shouldn't do anything, but everybody else keeps doing it. This is a serious problem. It's become safety. And it becomes also falls into the health, safety, and welfare of the community. And this is one that I think falls right in the wheelhouse of this. And it is one out of all the fees. It's probably one of the most important fees that the township's looking at now. Dan? Uh, yeah, so uh, Bob, I appreciate that and I'm not sure how to follow that up because um, I guess uh, I wasn't on the committee. I respect the work that you've done and your recommendations. I appreciate that. Um, so it's the, uh, I'm asking or questioning whether all the projects or all the dollars that are being put in uh, for the new, for the projects that we haven't done for the projects that you're saying we need to do. Um, when we talk about, you know, we need to do projects, it's a matter of when do they need to get done and which ones need to get done. Um, we're, we're always making decisions as to priorities um, and some things uh, don't get done. Um, so I'm, I'm just asking or challenging uh, whether all of them all of the money is needed here and all of these projects uh, have to get done in the, in the sh perhaps the short time frame uh, that is being suggested. Um, I, I just think that the dollars, um, you know, it, right, Cheltenham does have an infrastructure problem and people recognize that, but uh, other townships have infrastructure problems too. And if Cheltenham is socking their taxpayers with a huge fee uh, and we're in the forefront uh, um, of that. And frankly, and if we're spelling that fee out 
in a more transparent way than other townships, then we have a big PR problem. Mr. Chair? Uh, yes, sir. I have a question. I don't know if this is the forum to do this. Well, what's the other townships doing or what would we do with our religious organizations who just come and go, I can't pay that. I can't pay it. You know, our collection coffers are not what they used to be. And I can't pay it. I mean, then are we, you know, then going around the cycle of a collection agency and all that stuff like that? I mean, because we have lots of them here and they, when we go to them, so I don't know if this is a forum to ask that question, but what do we do? Or the ones who try to say, well, you're really, this is really a tax, but you're calling it a fee so you can get it from me as a nonprofit. So sure, what do I'll, we do in those particular- I'll cases? jump into that. Let's take a look at some of the, some of the um, places that are on here that have significant numbers of ERU Linwood, which, you know, Baron and I can talk about the fact that Linwood um, Holdings has, uh, is under assessed at this point, probably by 40, 30, 40 million dollars. Um, many of these, many of these uh, organizations, uh, Albert Einstein Medical Center, who pay their executives in the multi-millions and they, they've just been acquired and they make the grand total of a $25,000 contribution. Or Salas, which, which generously went from 10 to 20,000 <laughs> after they put a, a half million dollars out, uh, expected us to cover a half million dollars and probably put about $3 million into the building you know, of their physical therapy um, center. What we have, or I guess, and what we have everybody is a situation where they have had a free ride. Mo many of these institutions, many of these organizations have significant contribution to stormwater runoff. They have sizable amounts of impervious surface. And right now they contribute little to nothing to, to help to mitigate that. This is an accountability issue. It, they are creating the additional problems that impact our residents. We're not, we're not socking it to the residents any more than we're socking it to. We're asking people to contribute their fair share and their tax status and the things that they take advantage of really cost us, cost our residents in significant fashion. So I'd say you have to take a much closer oh. look at, at the fact that many of our commercial properties- Well, Mitch, I'm not talking about those, those particular ones. I'm talking about the, the, the religious organizations who don't have the money like Salas. Um, and what do we do if they don't pay? They just go, oh, you know, I'm sending you a letter. Thanks, but no thanks, you can't pay it. Yeah, I, don't well, know I, I, I don't know the exact answer to that, but if, if, if it's a fee like the trash fee and someone doesn't pay their trash fee, I would assume that we would have the ability to lean them. Yeah, lean that's. Them. I think that my answer would be the same as yours, Baron. That's exactly what I was thinking of, the trash fee. What, what percentage of the amount that we're collecting is coming from commercial properties versus residential versus nonprofits? Well, the, if you have eight thousand, if you have seven thousand ERUs, and your total is is what is it, sixteen thousand? So, uh, the, of the the residential, the single family residential is uh, ten thousand fourteen or ten thousand four hundred. The net we've assumed ninety five eleven divided by sixteen sixteen six eighty nine is around fifty seven percent of the net ERUs or revenue would come from single family residential. So the, about the, one and a half million. Right, the 43% comes from a combination of things, which is all these both nonprofits, commercial properties, religious institutions, the school district, all this stuff. I don't have it separately um, you know, figured out how much is coming say, for example, from religious institutions in particular. Um, um, I, I don't, I, I, I haven't tallied that up and, and Tell it's us again what you're doing with the school district and the well, Cheltenham you know, Township. Right now, the budget is set as if if they're all being charged a fee. And I've 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 had communities logic it different ways. Hamden Township said we're not just going to charge ourselves a fee. Why why you know, we just have to 
we're, we're going to excuse ourselves from the fee. Others have said, no, we're going to, it's an easy message to say, everybody pays. We're even charging the township. We're charging our school. Everybody pays. It's a, it just like everybody pays their electric bill and everything else. Are we permitted utility. to excuse the school district? Sure. Is that, is that legal to say we won't charge the school district? I was going to ask um, Tony that exact question. How many of these municipalities do that? I'm not aware of ones that I, I, I'd have to do research. I don't know the answer, but I'm not aware of ones that have given a complete exemption to school districts. I'm aware of credit policies that have developed certain credits that apply specifically to schools, like educational credits. So if they include something in their curriculum about you know, stormwater and things that you can take credit for under your MS4 permit, uh, minimum control reporting, where you're doing this outreach in public education, that's something you can take credit for. If the school does that, and a certain number of their grades in their, in their school, then they can get, it's not like taking a whole semester course, right? It's just whatever things we identify they can do. Maybe they get a 10 or 20% discount just for that without having to go, you know, maintain a stormwater basin. Uh, you already like exempt so many properties from township real estate taxes because they're nonprofits. What's the difference? You, the I'm, exempt, you know, we exempt many properties from, from township real estate taxes because they're nonprofits. Mr. Chairman, uh, Brett, it, it seems paradoxical. Uh, if we charge a school district, they're just going to increase their taxes to get it back. So the taxpayer ends up paying the money again instead of the school district. Right. Um, I would rather try to budget it, you know, ignoring the, the, the township who would also have the same choice in front of them if things run uh, short. Uh, and the school district because they're the other taxing entities which are going to end up sending necessary tax increases to cover that fee to the homeowners. And I, I don't like that because that will exempt the nonprofits from covering that portion of the, of the, of the cost. Yeah, I, I, and I agree with Brad that the homeowner is paying twice. Yes, I agree with Brad. Yeah, well, they're paying twice. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they wouldn't really pay twice because if you exempt the school district, then you're going to raise the fee a little bit. So they pay more. Whereas if you build a school district, then they pay a little less. Of course, then they have to pay a little more in their property taxes to, to, so it, it may six, six kind of be a, a net zero. Yeah. It, it, so maybe more of a perception issue than a, a true financial impact to the typical residential property owner. But I'd want to, I'd want to see those numbers because the school district automatically increases millage, which affects property values tremendously. Uh, until the pandemic hit and people started evacuating the city to buy houses in the suburbs, Cheltenham real estate was highly undervalued because of the high taxes. And they've, it's just come back to the level of about where it should be had it not taken the huge dip and then stayed down. And if I think that millage starts getting increased again, it's going to have a negative impact. It's why when we had to do an increase, we did EIT to keep it away from real estate millage. So while, while your basic figuring, it, it might be correct, and I'd have to see numbers to see if it's a net zero, I think the net impact is definitely a negative. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the reality in relation to the school district is, you know, the, the information that we've got recently with all of the kids that have gone to charter schools, cyber charter schools that, you know, were killed $42,000 a pop for um, during the pandemic is that those taxes are going to go up significantly, you know, to the max that they're allowed to um, pretty much every year for the foreseeable future. So I, I don't know if we're going to get relief right by not including them in this uh in this proposal for, for the residents the, the one thing I'm, just... I'm sorry for one second tony allison can you turn my chat function on do you, do you have the ability to turn the chat function on yeah can you can you turn that on mine, mine is sorry working. tony go ahead you know, I, I was just going to say, you know, w one of the things that we try to communicate to the public stuff is that, you know, this, you know, this is not a tax. This is a, a utility fee, like, you know, electric, water, 
gas, sewer, everything else, you know, and, and everybody pays that, the nonprofits pays that. And, and so um, we, we typically, or I typically don't see many groups of, of any like sort of carved out, well, we're gonna charge everybody the utility fee except for, you know, some some group. Um, so I think we just have to think, think carefully about the messaging if we are gonna say not charge the school district, you know, just that the rationale uh, well, what about private schools? Are we going to charge private educational institutions? You know, um, I, I don't disagree with you, Tony. I just would be more comfortable if we had numbers to support it. Tony, do most municipalities exempt themselves? <clears throat> I, I don't. No, I don't. At, I don't at the same know. time, we don't have to fully discuss this yet. It occurs to me that the township has a lot of parks and a lot of the land that it owns is parkland, not impervious surface. But we can discuss that at a different time. I was just wondering, do most municipalities automatically exempt themselves? I'd have to do some research. I know I, I know specifically Hamden Township exempted themselves. I, I, I could do some research on some that I've worked on and go back and just refresh my memory if, if you, the ones- Yeah, can you find out if it's legal to exempt the school district? Yeah, and, and also, does it make sense for Cheltenham to exempt itself or does it actually make more sense to not exempt itself because we have so many parks compared to any other property owner in the township? <coughs> What what would the um, what would the parks have to do with it, Joe? That they don't have impervious surface. That they're that they're forest and grass, and they're not impervious surface. Yeah, well, but we're we're only measuring the impervious. Right. But well, wouldn't so, we if we have if, a, if we have a credit program? Wouldn't we get credit, credit for program, that? We get a we lot get of credit credits for all the grass that we have and forest. Well, the, the well, way the credit program is currently written, you, just for having grass or, or, or trees isn't credit. It's really, do you have best management practices, you know, that treat the impervious area on your, on your properties? Then, um, well, well, unless that changes, then it probably makes more sense for the township to consider exempting its own. Yeah, so if, 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 the, if the township were to charge itself 500 ERUs, that means the rate they charge everybody for stormwater fee could be slightly lower, right? Because if the township is paying that, granted, that's coming out of the general fund, so that, 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 that comes out of taxes, right? Um, so, you know, if, if it, again, the, the bottom line to a typical residence property may, may I don't know, may not have a huge impact there, but it's, it's, so it's really a perception. Do you want a higher fee, stormwater fee, or do you want to lower it, you know, and get to the same bottom line amount of total revenue in the end? Um, yeah. I, I, mean, I, I do I, remain I, concerned about a, a $55 a quarter or 220 a year. Not, granted, we had one public meeting and we didn't really get much pushback, but that's a very small sample of, of the, the community that certain businesses maybe that are struggling or whatnot may, you know, really you know, struggle with that. So I, I am sympathetic to that, but I, you know, I also understand that is the most true representation of how to truly allocate the costs fairly for stormwater is by including the full program in there. So it's a, it's kind of a tough, it's not, it's not an easy decision. <laughs> May I ask you to rephrase the question before you consider it? Again, I'm not sure if my hand raised was seen. Yeah, it, it is. So, so I believe I made the motion um, originally, probably about a half hour ago. Um, and my motion at that point in time, Tony, if you could go back to the slide showing the, the prices, uh, the ERU prices. Um, my recommendation was that we that we would move forward with the um, ERU fee of uh, $55 per ERU, which would be the full program fee 
um, at this point in time, understanding that if you know we had excess reserves or not reserves, so if we had excess funding for whatever reason that projects didn't get done, we could always lower the fee. But to Tony's point that he just made, it is the most equitable way to distribute the uh, the uh, um, you know equ equitably across across all categories. I don't know if that helps, but my brain doesn't work after eleven. Yeah. So, yeah. so one more follow up question then. I I don't know if it's appropriate with the same motion, um, but if we're going to sell sell this. Uh, just as you described, um, uh, in some equitable fashion, that I don't see how you cannot include the idea of a reduction in the real estate tax, um, because you're going to be explaining to the residents that some of that a million and a half of these dollars are, is coming out of our operating fund. That that is that is correct, but as as you know well, Dan, you know we have obligations that go up every year. So there may not be a reduction in the real estate tax, but maybe there is a smaller increase um, in the real estate tax, you know, may, maybe we could position it that way. But, you know, to say that there would be a reduction when we have significant um, contractual obligations, you know, moving forward, I, I don't know if we could, if we could say that at this point in time. And, and especially not knowing what what revenue is is looking like going forward. So there's a so, motion. Yep. Second the motion. All right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Any confused? Reluctantly. Aye. Uh, All right, so we have the three tier with the condo in the middle and the $55 ERU fee. And the enterprise uh, funding. And, and the enterprise structure. And some homework for Tony and for some of us. Yeah, I'm going to try and do some research to see who, who, which communities I can figure out have exempted themselves, you know, from the fee, and if I can find out any more about how, if if I can find any examples where schools have been entirely exempted. Right. Um, like we I've also seen. should circulate the list of potential projects so that the board, the full board, sees just how extensive the number of potential projects would be. Because right. I don't think it's. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So what you had current projects too, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, Tony, well, can you also do a little work on that enterprise fund and let us know how that would work? Um, yeah. So th this is the list that, you know, was laid out in terms of the, the, ma the magnitude of the large projects, the intermediate projects, and some of the just smaller repair projects. Are there yeah. estimated costs that go with each one of those projects? There's a uh, global estimate. Many of them don't have detailed designs or concept designs and cost estimates. So there's certain things like the Army Corps and Glenside projects had a better sense of the debt service for that. There's 225000 a year. These other 36 projects were just put in at an average 150000 each, you know, $5.4 million divided over 10 years and, and the 540000 that fed into that. So that'll get refined over time as those projects get further evolved and maybe it goes up, maybe it goes down. I don't know. But that was based on the input I had, sort of what we thought was a reasonable. So we can manage the enterprise fund dynamically. We, we do it for the first year, the first two years have the dollars allocated, have the projects. And then if we see that there is money left over, we, we reduce the stormwater fee by you know, a, a comparable number, or we increase the number of projects. Right. Well, isn't, excuse me, but isn't another way 
to, to structure it, even if you're using all of your costs, you know, we're funding all of them, like we do with, the, uh, with our capital budget, where we say, well, here's our list of to-dos, but we're not going to actually uh, allocate for this year. Um, I, I mean, it would be possible to reduce the amount and still and, and still charge the full amount for that for that year's capital projects and operating projects. So, so I would think there's a little wiggle room in that, still funding all of what we do, but maybe not being as aggressive in the same time frame that that it's set out right now. What I was saying, Ann. Like any utility, I'm sure you'll find yourself managing your priorities to whatever your budgetary constraints are, no matter where we set the fee, right? And 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 whatnot. So. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I would love to try to go for the record tonight, but um, I think we've gotten to a good place um, on stormwater. We've got some some follow up items, and we've been able to move move uh, move the ball down the field on a couple of uh, on a couple of items. So I think that that's good, Tony. I appreciate the time. Um, I appreciate the feedback from from all the commissioners, from all the residents online, and um, Tony, if you could close your screen, I could see the. Uh, my agenda here. Um, I will try. Or maybe, wait a minute, view options. Wait a minute, here we go. 50%. All this right. This is the IDA. Oh, all right. All right, uh, who do we have from the IDA? I am here, Merle Lockrock. How do you do? I'm an attorney at Hamburg Rubin and I've been representing the IDA almost from the beginning. Um, did you tune in tonight? What time did you tune in? <laughs> at eight o'clock. <laughs> and we're well, way past uh, time. So I'll make this real short. If I'll just beautiful. give you a quick overview. Um, the township formed the IDA in 2003 by ordinance. And, um, you know, the IDA, like any other authority, has uh, bylaws. Uh, it's supposed to have five members. Currently, it only has three members. Uh, we've had some attrition and there's been no new appointments. So we have uh, David Simonetti is the chair. Adam Silverman and Brian Regley are also members of the board. Um, in the past, you have um, appointed past uh, managers to be members of the board. David Cranach had been on the board and um, Brian had been, had been on the board. Um, the township has taken care of oversight of the um, financial record keeping for the authority because the authority has no staff. My office you know, acts as basically their administration uh, if a transaction comes in. And I will get in and tell you a little about what we do actually. But so the township staff has traditionally taken care of the uh, financial record keeping and also has arranged to order the uh, annual audit from the same um, auditors as the township. Um, what the industrial development uh, authority does. It's formed under state statute that uh, authorizes the creation of um, economic and industrial development authorities. Uh, we facilitate as a conduit issuer, we'll call, we're called, um, tax exempt uh, financing is largely what we do um, for nonprofits and manufacturing. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of new manufacturing looking for uh, financing, but occasionally we get manufacturing transactions, but it uh, will finance um, like private schools. Uh, a lot of religious organizations have um, educational uh, facilities that can be financed. 
um, your IDA financed a nonprofit that provides um, aids and assistance to elderly folks. Um, we have done things like uh, financed uh, nonprofit associations like professional type associations, um, medical nonprofits, uh, just trying to, so those about, are- How those about are real the, estate acquisition? Not, not straight real estate, no, it has to be, I mean, the acquisition by a nonprofit or a manufacturing facility can go in there, but no, we, we are not authorized to finance uh, real estate that's unrelated to those other purposes. Merle, uh, the other say, thing we've- Merle, yeah. when you say finance, could you define that for me? Are you giving- Well, we're funds? a conduit issuer. We issue notes or bonds um, through, by, by the authority under the state statute and also by IRS regulations. So as long as everyone jumps through the hoops and sets things up the way they're required by the state and federal statutes, the financing uh, can be categorized as tax exempt so that there are lower rates that can be achieved that way to the borrower. What happens on um, the fall? I'm sorry? What happens if there's a default? If there is a default, then the we don't issue the funds. We are a conduit. We don't issue any funds. We issue a note and then that's assigned if in the case of... Um, of like a bank financed um, uh, loan. We can also issue public bonds. However, on the municipal IDA level, that's very uncommon because we also have a limit on our lending because the, the township IDA is handling only what's called bank qualified tax exempt financing. So there is something called a volume cap. And I, I don't wanna get into the weeds, but we don't go above 10 million a year. We also have limits because we're, we're um, counted in with any other tax exempt financing of the related entities of the township. So as you're all aware, the Cheltenham Township has been doing a lot of infrastructure work and taking financing over the last number of years. During those years, the volume cap was reached by the township. So the authority was unable to facilitate any of those loan transactions because of that volume cap during those years. The other thing that we've done is, um, and this is the second time we're doing this with Arcadia, is we are acting as a facilitator for what's called an RACP grant or RACB grant from the Commonwealth. Um, and for acting as the intermediary there, which is required by the state that they have an organization to act in that capacity, we will receive a fee. Um, so, so that's... So so yeah. I'm sorry. So Merle, just to clarify, so if if the township wanted to acquire real estate and use the IDA as as you know the mechanism to do that, is that is is that something that can be facilitated? Um, the IDA has um, you know as its goal is to um, facilitate economic development, health, welfare, uh, improvement of the township and its residents and its businesses. Um, if something is furthering that purpose, it, it is a potential. I represent seven IDAs and the county IDA. None of them have ever held real estate. That's not saying they cannot do it. In fact, you know, as you may know, the state statute has recently changed that actually identifies that a township of the first class can um, uh, enter into a uh, transaction for real estate with an industrial development authority. You have to keep in mind though, that the IDA has very little funds. We don't have taxing power. We only receive funds that we raise from these 
transactions. So owning real estate comes with a lot of obligations, maintaining, managing, paying taxes, et cetera, et cetera, ensuring um, the authority just doesn't have the funds to buy or maintain and carry the costs of real estate. Um, you know, there may be ways to work around that, but that's, you know. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and as I, you know, I discussed this with your solicitor, I, I want to check out and make sure um, that there are no other requirements, uh, which my board hasn't authorized me to do at this point. So I haven't done that. Um, Does anyone have any questions for Merle? Chairman. More than I care to express tonight. <laughs> Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes, Bob? Um, I'd like to ask while uh, we have this on the agenda, uh, if the board would consider appointing uh, the board president, Dan Norris, as a member of the board of the IDA? Um, I will second Dan. that. Wait, Dan, Fine idea. Yes. Would, would you I'm like to, would you like to be on the IDA board? Uh, yes, I yes I would. I, okay. I've been okay. con I've been concerned about some uh, some things in the past, and I uh, I'd like to have uh, commissioner involvement in the board, so I'm volunteering. Oh, I have no disagreement. I just wanted to make sure you weren't being you know bamboozled one way or the other and surprised. Oh, you just been volunteered. Thanks, I volunteer. Oh, thanks, Dan. <laughs> I'm being volunteered. Great. So, Brad, thank you for making that motion. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Wonderful. Thank you for that. Well, that's great. Welcome. And we we still have we typically had five members, so um, we still have a vacancy there. We'll keep looking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And we usually, we don't go till after 11 at night, so. <laughs> Dan will uh, change. What's that? <laughs> Dan will change that. Oh, no, Dan will change that, thanks. <laughs> if you put Dan and I on it, it could All be right. a marathon. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Merle, uh, for coming yes. in and, you know, looking forward to uh, working closer with the IDA. Okay, thank you very much. Good night. Thank, thank you, you for joining us. Good night. Good luck getting right. done. <laughs> Number two, uh, review of the executive <laughs> financial summary report, February 28th. Any questions, comments on that report? Motion to accept? Aye. Aye. All right. Uh, number Aye. three, report from our interim finance officer. Uh, nothing significant to report. I do want to say that uh, Allison, Bob, and I uh, spoke with Tony to talk about um, the process of collecting um, the fees under the program. Um, and we discussed the things we learned from the changeover in the billing when we went to the new um, sewer uh, charges. Um, and uh, we had some rough spots with that. So I think we have learned from that uh, in a way that will make things uh, smoother um, if this is adopted. That's it, Baron. All right. Well, thank you. And I'll, I'll let everyone know I gave Steve an out, but he still hung in there. So <laughs> he, he, he gave me an out at 1130. Uh, so um, yeah. Thanks, you, need Steve. To, you, you need to hire a younger um, finance officer who can stay up late at night. There you go. We're working on it. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks, Steve. Uh, number four, report from our director of fiscal affairs. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Good morning. To... <laughs> not quite, not quite. Uh, uh, just going to give a brief high level overview of where we where things stands as of today. Uh, we're just looking at the general funds. Uh, uh, revenue process progress has decreased from prior year levels, uh, roughly about 20%. The regression, although uh, it is, is due to the timing of the remittance of the earned income tax. Um, that's where you're seeing the bulk of it. If we extrapolate that out, uh, we're actually exceeding prior year levels by $11,000, uh, just real over 1%. So actually the revenues are actually doing uh, better than we were uh, this time last year. 
Um, we do have, uh, we have reached out to Berkheimer, so those, those, those remittances are coming over. Um, the year-to-date uh, general fund expenditures have decreased uh, significantly. We've decreased uh, expenditures from this point last year by $370,000, um, roughly uh, 7%, uh, so that's good. The township's combined budgetary uh, performance has actually increased by over $50,000 from the 2020 levels. Uh, so just want to give that brief high-level overview. Um, we do have some standout positions. Uh, one of those things, uh, currently right now, residential is still um, a popular item over here in Cheltenham Township, as, as Commissioner Press has alluded to earlier. Um, the property values have returned to those levels, and we are doing uh, swimmingly. Um, this time last year, we were doing 6% um, of our revenue. Our general fund revenue at this point was coming from real estate deed transfer. Uh, this time this year, we're at 20%. So home sales are still on the rise here in Cheltenham Township. We're still a little popular place. Um, if there's anything more you want me to dig into, I will, but just considering the time, I didn't know how, how, how deep of a dive you wanted me to do. Yeah, no, that, that was great. And just one, one question, and I'll open it up. Um, it's from a, from a revenue perspective, um, as we're coming into closing out the first quarter, um, any insights as to you know, the rest of the year? Uh, as of right now, um, I, I will say that we are doing okay with as far as real estate and, and the collections, we do see a higher real estate tax collection coming in. Um, but uh, just digging into a little bit uh, later, I, I will hold off on saying where we are going to be. I'll wait for the quarter to close out before I make any uh, assumptions at that point. Okay, fair enough. Any, any additional questions for Nate? All right, wonderful. Thank you, uh, thank you for that update. Um, do we have any old business? All of it's old now. Ed, you, you, you say that joke every time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the meetings uh, get right, later well, every time. It's better and better. <laughs> We'll move on to new business number six, uh, A and B, uh, recommending the Board of Commissioners uh, reauthorize the purchase of five 2020 police vehicles in the amount of $188,300, see attached. Um, and in addition, we have the upfitting of those police vehicles, $26,366.63. Uh, Bob, you, do you wanna provide color around, around A and B? Sure. Um, these were never formally approved by the board last year. These were done administratively and not approved by the board. And for us to go forward and actually approve the payments of these, uh, these need to come in front of the board for approval. So uh, since we are now under the new approval process, bringing things to the board, uh, before we can actually process these, the board needs to make these approvals. So that's why 2020 vehicles are back in front of you. For approval and authorization. Yep. And have they been received yet? Uh, they have been received. Uh, they are sitting there. And uh, that's why uh, they are still sitting there. They have not been put into use. They have not had any of the upfitting done at all on these vehicles uh, until actually the board has authorized these formally. All right. Thank you. Any questions? Or do I have a motion? So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Um, item C, uh, recommend to the Board of Commissioners authorization of the painting of three, uh, not five, or maybe that's an error, you can let me know, of the 2020 police vehicles by Mako Collision Repair and Auto Body, uh, low cost estimate of $5,495.85. I did see that you had multiple estimates. This was the lowest. Um, do you want to add some color around the reasoning here? Um, sure. Um, Repainting these... does represent color. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, these are, um, it would be in line with the new approved uh, design of the vehicles. Um, we would ask that the price not exceed $16,487.55. Um, this money would come out of the asset and forfeiture fund. So it would not come out of the general fund or any taxpayer dollars. It would come out of the asset and forfeiture fund. Um, so I am asking the board to consider um, the painting of these vehicles, uh, and hopefully we can do a little better than the 1648755. Commissioner Rappaport first, and then Commissioner Norris. Thank you. As 
I have a bunch of comments on this, uh, just to clarify. Originally, the new uh, vehicles were not going to cost, as we change over the fleet, the new vehicles would be painted as part of the um, as part of the process with no additional funding. Um, and that's the new five, the five new ones that would automatically get painted anyway. This are, these are the three that we just took possession of, right? So they already were painted and this is asking for an additional 16,000 plus dollars, right? That's correct. Okay, my feeling is very strongly that that isn't what we approved when we approved the painting in the first place. Just in order to move up the timeline for the completion of the fleet, eventually getting, getting three cars faster, I don't think that's a good use, even certainly not of, of taxpayer money. But keep in mind that our budget is funding things like vests for the police that otherwise might come from the forfeiture. You know, we could insist that they pay for some of that stuff through the for forfeiture funding. So to me, this is not money that is wisely spent. It's taking away from other uses. I, I think it is absolutely a frill to push up the timeline just so that we can change the color of the fleet a couple of year, a year sooner. Um, so no, I, I, I will be I, can, I, I will be voting no on this, and I I think there's just no justification. Everyone, hold on to your seats. I completely agree with Ann. I would, uh, Mr. North. Dan. Oh um, well, I actually had a different. I, I don't know if you want to finish that discussion. I, I had a different. My question was simply on the forfeiture of the funds, uh, the forfeiture account. Do, do you, um, Bob, now have control of that because that previously the police department was responsible for that? That is correct. Nate has control of that and that has to come, those expenditures have to come through the board for approval. It is not where they can use and do what they want anymore out of that account. Okay, Brad, I'll let you go. Thank you. Well, I, I, given that fact, thank you, Dan. Um, would I be rash to assume that they have substantially more than that in the fund? For the painting, uh, there's there's probably over two hundred thousand dollars sitting in that account, which would probably cover a few thousand to paint. Um, yes, I, I agree with Commissioner Rappaport wholeheartedly. I know it's late, people, but try to accept that. Um, and I do think that the painting is kind of superfluous on the new vehicles, uh, and if we want to get them painted, it should come from the forfeiture funds. Uh, it's it's sort of whipped cream uh, and not out of our budget. Um, as it is, the cars are the new cars are going to cost us about forty three thousand dollars a piece fitted out. That's uh, that's a chunk of money. Um, so I, I'm in complete agreement with that, and would move to request that you look into using those funds instead no, of no. That's yeah. not what I was saying. Yeah. No. Sorry. So, so let, so let, if I, I'm if, saying, I could, if I could, some, all right, go, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, let Ann make her point because I want to make sure I understood it. I'm People saying not it doesn't matter where those funds are coming <laughs> from. Don't they're do better it. spent, they're better spent on other uses for the police department. All right, the, then the, let, let me rephrase it. Uh, I agree with that also. And if it doesn't have a negative impact on other things they could do and they are, they are, very concerned about having mismatched paint on their cars, the funds should come from there and not from the from our capital budget. That's all. So and there's an if there, Ann. If and can you can you put your can you put your comment in the form of a motion? Uh, I I move that this is a change order that uh, I don't accept. Uh, I I recommend <laughs> that we do not accept this recommendation. All right, so there's a motion on the floor to not accept the recommendation, uh, no matter where the funds are, are coming from. Um, all in favor? Aye. Do you have a discussion? discussion on that, or is it already too late? Uh, no, discussion on the motion. There's sir. always time to talk. Yeah. Any, any, well, we any, any opposed? We want to hear from our manager. Yeah. 
I, I, I just I just think it's not frivolous. I think when you're looking at a vehicle that's going to last five to six years, it hasn't hit the road yet. And for $16,000, if coming out of asset and forfeiture to put the fleet in the right direction, um, if, if we're that, that harsh to look for that kind of money to put the fleet in the right direction, because these vehicles are going to last five, six years. This isn't taking existing fleet and turning it around. I don't think it's frivolous. I don't think it's whipped cream. I think this is a good investment into the vehicles in turning the fleet because they are brand new vehicles and these were brand new vehicles hitting the road. This is not where these vehicles in 2020, they're already out in the road. They haven't hit the road yet. So respectfully, I will disagree uh, with the comments made. No, and thank, thank you for that. Do we have any opposed to, to that vote? I, no, but I, I, I oppose. I, I would, I would like us to keep an open mind about the forfeiture funds, because the last time we had to talk to them about using them, it was for a much larger issue uh, that they felt they were just going to keep their little fund separate. But, now that the township right. manager has right. All right. oversight, the, the proposal yeah. is to use All the right, forfeiture drop. funds, right? I mean, the, the right. recommendation that that not not Commissioner Rappaport's motion, but the proposal is to use the forfeiture funds. The funds right. right. And just for an update, we have, uh, and thank you, Nate, we have $340,000 in that account in the asset and forfeiture account. And how much are we paying for the vests? On, it was on a different uh, budget or a different, uh, I guess it was in, in was public a, safety tonight. That was in public safety. It was. Right. right. Yeah. So what what were uh, and that was coming from our budget not the forfeiture budget right yes that, that yeah. is correct yes yes what about uh, body cameras yeah so i'm saying <coughs> body cameras uh vests, body, ca all of body cameras were coming out of the forfeiture and asset account yeah so uh, i think those are more substantive um expenditures that it's, I think it's are all, exactly it's already voted on. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for that. Item Thank D, you. recommending to the Board of Commissioners to authorize payment to Lukens and Wolf LLC, Valbridge Property Advisors in the amount of 10000 for Township Assessment Appeals. Um, this basically has to do with uh, the reassessment committee that myself and Commissioner Zygmunt felt sit on. Uh, we've been very successful. Um, in um, challenging some of the, uh, the assessments and getting appeals, getting them settled and increasing the revenue uh, to the school district and the township. Um, sometimes we need to get appraisals um, and uh, outside advisors and that's what this is authorizing. Are there any questions? All right, I so move, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Item E. Aye. Uh, recommend the Board of Commissioners considers retaining the services of Zelenkovsky Axelrod LLC to perform the township's annual audits of the pension plans, IDA, and financial statements. Uh, Bob, anything to add there? Yes, I think they're a very good firm. I know Jeff Weiss uh, is here from ZA. Uh, he has sat through here, so uh, if you would like to have any questions directed at him, did somebody hey, Jeff, wake him up? <laughs> Jeff, what time did you come in this evening? <laughs> I, I I listened to the agenda and I keep logged on at eight o'clock, but I will admit I was working most of the time. So I'm glad to hear it. I also have to tell you, Chairman Holland. Yes. Very rarely do I get correct pronouncements of the firm. So congratulations. First time. Thank you very much. <laughs> and at 12 o'clock at night. So I think 12 o'clock at night. I think you've been practicing it the last four hours. There you go, maybe. Um, so do I have a motion? So moved. I'm trying to move down to the bottom and see what they want to charge us. All, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, thank you. Uh, item F, recommend the Board of Commissioners approve Grand hey, Turkey. Hey, hey, Jeff, we'll have more questions for you at future meetings. When you're, when you're ready you. to talk about the Enterprise Fund Accounting, have Bob give me a call. <laughs> talk about it, so. <laughs> All right, sweeper repair, 35,000, all in favor. Uh, I just have a question, Aye. what happened to that sweeper? 
Oh, you have to ask Jim. Jim sat here through the whole meeting. <laughs> I can't believe I did it. What, what does what does a brand new sweeper cost? That's what I want to know. A brand new sweeper, a brand new sweeper will cost you two hundred and ninety thousand dollars. All right, what happened to the hydraulics in this Old. one? That was the problem. Can we paint it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not, quite, not quite. That's kind of like putting a lipstick on a pig. Good lie, then. <laughs> the problem with it is black paint. <laughs> the problem with it is. Um, it just gets old and you get a lot of debris that's actually on the inside working parts of that sweeper. So you have a broom that's on the back. If you think about it, it has a conveyor. The conveyor is sort of um, like the supermarket. When you put your groceries on a conveyor belt and it goes down, only this conveyor is made out of metal. So the conveyor actually has chains and sprockets attached to it. And what happens is with all the debris that's being picked up, it's not just dirt. You have different aggregate when you have the potholes out there. You also have the leaves and you have other debris like when it's salty out, when it's salt on the road. So all that can sit on the working components and it just wears it away. So, so they don't take this to the sweet sleeper car wash or something? <laughs> no, unfortunately. And you can only clean it but so much. Uh, it, it gets into places that you really don't see or that won't be seen uh, normally. And what can happen is the chain after a while, it actually starts to move a little bit slower because it's breaking down. Mm -hmm. That in turn actually makes the motors overheat, the seals will overheat. So basically what happened you ha is you had a catastrophic failure on that one. So that one had a problem with the conveyor sprockets and chains, hydraulic pump, as well as the hoses. Uh, you have rotted sheet metal and the motors that drive the conveyor. You also have what's called a scissor lift that moves the hopper up and down to dump it once it's full with all the debris that's been collected by the machine. Jim, so, you had so us when the conveyor belt was moving the groceries. <laughs> Well, I was giving you. I was giving you I'm trying to understand what's actually still working. Wow. <laughs> Wheel <Wheels turn. laughs> wow. so move. Yeah, I, I think we already voted on that, and it was supposed to be not a mess. Yeah. yeah. Don't Thanks for hopper. sticking around. Okay. Thank you. Jim. So, uh, last item of the night, number seven, Bob. I guess uh, there are two items here that you wanted to discuss. Right. Uh, quickly, uh, the financial software update. Uh, I know that uh, Nate uh, will no longer have hair if we continue to work with the software that we have. <laughs> um, so that's something that uh, I know he'll be bringing proposals to you shortly. <laughs> Nate, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, uh, just briefly, we are having some you know, serious issues with the financial software, as Bob has alluded to. Uh, we are working through it. Um, at this time, but as, as he stated, I will be bringing you guys proposals as this software, uh, I don't, I'm sure you are, are aware that the software was originally purchased in 1989. Uh, we recently paid for an interface upgrade. It does not suit our needs or uh, we're, we're doing a lot of Band-Aid style operation just to make it work so that we can get the work Nate, done that we need. Nate, why did we pay for a, a patch to that? Isn't that written in, I think at Fortran? Um, <laughs> You'd have to ask. Football. No, I, I'm our, serious. I remember Steve, Steve Burns used to complain all the time. That anytime he wanted to report, he had to go to a programmer in the county. Correct. To get, to get written. And unfortunately, his predecessor kept telling us, yeah, they're making progress. They're, they're moving us forward. but And nothing was ever done. Uh, and now you've inherited that. Correct. Mess. I've inherited that. And we actually pay an annual fee for those custom reports. That, Nate, is there also an uh, ability to orchestrate this with the software much? issues uh, in the tax office so that we I can have, have a single system that actually speaks to each other? Well, yes, we have explored different things. I've actually reached out to the county, um, gotten their recommendations on the software as well as uh, the software that I, I would like to use, and they are fully integratable with one another. Um, I have been speaking with the tax office about that. Um, so that that'll all come to you. One thing that's going to be uh, that, that is going to need to be done, and I'm also intending on bringing to you this recommendation with you. A lot of the new softwares will require that we update our computer systems. Uh, right now, 
Um, for instance, all, every computer inside of the finance department is Windows 7, um, which is incompatible with a lot of the newer softwares. Uh, they won't allow us. Can we use forfeit your funds to pay for this? Uh, for the one of the computers, the we might need. <laughs> all right, so, so, so the proposal's forthcoming, so let's not beat a dead horse tonight. Um, how about the uh, facility asset condition? That's one that uh, I know that you have an awful lot on your plate as the board, but uh, one of the PFM recommendations were facilities. Our facilities uh, continue to go downhill um, and we continue to find more and more issues within there. Um, at, it, hopefully at, uh, maybe the next meeting, uh, if it's be, maybe even broken up over several committees uh, at a high level to look at the facilities of how we want to start to address these because the costs are going to mount quickly on us here, uh, looking at the infrastructure, the HVAC, roofs, structures, everything, uh, to how we want to proceed. And we'll be looking at the board from a high level, how you would want us to go. Uh, I know Lisa has spoken, and I know she's sat through this here too, about library buildings and the conditions of those, which uh, are our buildings too as well. But there are multiple issues that we need to start looking at and addressing uh, and it's, I, it's coming faster than what we probably all anticipated. And again, it's another one of those that, congratulations, all of you, you've inherited the problems that have existed for many, many years. And unfortunately, it's come down to you now to make some hard decisions here. So I'm not gonna be, go, go any longer with that, but that's something that that conversation is, is gonna have to have you know, sooner than later. There's the million four that we leave in the budget to cover those kinds of expenses. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, can I ask Got them covered. Uh, Commissioner Armin and Commissioner Brockington. Yeah, j just very quickly. Um, I know uh, Lisa McClure is here. She, she sort of slogged through this meeting with us. Um, so uh, in fairness, I'd like to give her just 30 seconds to Sorry, Lisa, but 30 seconds to That's okay. sort of um, ex express uh, some input on this uh, important issue. Um, library's feeling is that, um, as, as Bob said once, uh, we're afraid that we're going to be throwing good money after bad. Um, and that there's such severe problems in the branches that any review of the facilities would be for repair as... Um, opposed to a renovation. Um, you know, we, as, as you said, we've got HVAC, roof ceilings, mold remediation. We have plastic windows on one side of Glenside. Um, there's no chance of even addressing um, adding a, a raised floor or digging trenches um, in masonry to put in new power and data. Um, and we can't add any modern technology, like for example, at Glenside was one plug along the entire back of, uh, with not a single plug in the entire back of, of Glenside. Um, you know, and also repairs and renovations could prompt ADA renovation uh, compliance. Um, and, you know, I guess my, my main fear is it's so costly that it doesn't contribute to library missions. So th thank you for that. Um, the, the one plug um, on the whole floor, it reminds me of my house, but be that <laughs> as it may. Um, uh, Bob, as we sort of uh, decide how to proceed with some of these things in the various committees, um, I think it's important to get the continued feedback from Cheltenham uh, Township Library System. So thank Absolutely. you, Lisa, and thank you, Bob. And Absolutely. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep, you're, you're very welcome. And Bob, so were you, were you recommending a subcommittee to to start to look at this issue? If if we could do that, that would be ideal. And I, I think that looks at the bigger bigger picture of uh, all our facilities. And as the PFM report looks at potential consolidation in those items to categorize yeah. where we want to go. So I, I would volunteer for that committee. Do I have any other? That's what I, that's what I. Commissioner Rappaport, Commissioner Pransky, and <laughs> and I'm sure once we get to a point, we'll, we'll start to have some, some uh, resident feedback. 
So a committee uh, is formed. Um, Mr. Thank Mr. you Mr. for that. I'm sorry, Irv. Yeah, just one quick question for Bob. I know it's late. Bob, can it, can you give us a quick update on the uh, new com, um, website for the township? Uh, we had met earlier this week. Uh, I think there's still a few questions that have come up in regards to some pricing, but my hope is that next month we will be back to you with a proposal and presentation on a uh, direction we're going to go with the upgrade uh, to the uh, okay. township website. At a reasonable cost. All right. Absolutely. Thank you, yes. Mr. Chair. Um, Robert, we're coming to you in a second. Allison, I know you have just an, a couple of items, uh, and then we'll go to Citizens Forum for uh, Mr. Hislop. Yeah, it's uh, just one brief item. Um, I would like to ask the board, to, the committee, to recommend authorizing Gannett Fleming um, to map the township stormwater facilities in GIS which is a requirement that we need um, to meet the MS4 requirements. Um, so um, the total, we've, we've taken several quotes and the total um, or the lowest bid was $5,500, which was Gannett Fleming. Um, question, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman? Yes. Allison, a question. Um, in the earlier meeting today with uh, Tony Dill, we talked about the fact that we need, we could use the mapping. Would the work that Gannett Fleming does help us in being a little more accurate in our mapping for um, for the properties and the potential to actually be more exact in the um, in the calculations of the ERUs? Um, this would be mapping out uh, the storm sewer lines and inlets and outfalls. Um, so it will be a basis for us and and be very helpful in our stormwater management program. But I don't know that it would help with what you're asking for. Okay, thank you. Yeah, do I, have, do I have a motion based upon Allison's recommendation? So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank and, you. Uh, Commissioner thank you. Holland, that new committee is gonna meet right after this meeting, right? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Mr. Uh, Mr. Hislop, <laughs> Citizens Forum. Yes, Robert Hislop, 211 Harrison. Um, Commissioner Zingenfeld, you, I'll adjust what you just said first, even though that's not why I raised my hand. Uh, if we could talk privately, I think I could address what you just asked. Okay. All right, thanks. And you got my commitment. And the um, reason why I rose my hand uh, back then, I think you were spending about 10 minutes on um, a question and it occurred to me that the rewording of that question might be helpful. So uh, Mr. Dill's not in the room, but at least, um, you can consider this if it helps when you get to that point. You were talking about um, exempting the township and exempting the school district. And I'm not sure that you even wanna use the word exempt, um, but of more concern was, I think what you were trying to address, which was difficult, uh, would be better if you asked the question, not to build the taxpayers or not to bill for properties that are billed to the taxpayers or something like that. And then I realized that that, that would probably get you to a, a better answer than what you were uh, wrestling with, but it's probably not what the taxpayers wanna hear anyway, but at least it's accurate. I think, I think the taxpayers are responsible for the township property and they are responsible for the school district property as opposed to any other schools. That would be the key point. I suppose that nonprofits are not responsible for taxes, but yet they are for this fee and then the commercial. So I, I think you're gonna have an easier time with the answer if you, if you get away from exempting the, that word at all, but also the school district or the, or the uh, township and make it in light of who's paying the bill. But I don't even have an answer for it. I just thought that would speed things along when you get to it. Yeah, well, th thank you for that input. Maybe we Mr. Have any Bagley also can, can weigh in on that at some point. At, at some point, uh, I, I agree. I think I commented <laughs> in the direction from Mr. Heslop. I would, I would say, I think you wanna exempt the township, but we can discuss it at a later time. 
Well, I was going to say that I, there were only two attorneys in the room and I wasn't one of them. <laughs> Any other uh, citizens for Citizens Forum? Motion to adjourn. All right. Thank you all. Thank all you, everybody. Thank you, everybody.